Welcome back again to another Rules webinar. My name is Miguel Castro and today I will be guiding you through this Rules webinar which topic is oil spill mapping with Sentinel-1 data. So as you can see we will be working uh, in a different study area but I will give you more information about that. So before starting let me tell you the objectives of this session. You will learn two main things. First, how to do oil spill mapping with Sentinel-1 data and second, what is the root service and how it can help you in your projects with Sentinel data. Therefore, for this exercise, we will combine the root service and the capabilities of Sentinel-1 for oil spill mapping. So just before starting, be aware that this webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to uh, watch again the video and repeat the exercise. So, so I will give you more information on that later on, but just for you to be aware. So let's move and let's have a look very quickly to the outline of this webinar. So we will first um, have a look to our study area for today, some brief comments about that. We will then cover very briefly the, the theory behind the use of satellite Earth observation for this type of applications. We will then describe the root service and what it is so that you can understand how it can benefit uh, your projects. And then we will use the root service to perform the exercise of today. At the end, we will, um, we will have some time for questions and answers. So um, just feel free if you have doubts during the session to send them uh, through the specific tool we have. If not, if not, you can just wait uh, until the end. So let's get started and let's start by our study area. So um, this time we are traveling to Kuwait in the Middle East. This country is located in a section of one of the driest and least hospitable deserts on Earth and the fourth by area, the Arabian Desert. This tiny country was a British protectorate from 1899 until 1961, and oil reserves in commercial quantities were discovered in the 30s. From that moment, the country underwent large-scale modernization. By 1950s, the country became the largest oil exporter in the Persian Gulf region. So last August 10th, 2017, so last summer, an oil spill was reported in the south of Kuwait near the Al Karim area, where the Al Kafir offshore oil field is located. So while the cause of the incident is not clear, around 130,000 liters have been leaked based on conservative estimations made by external organizations. So we have here this false uh, coal composition of Kuwait, and our study area today is here in the south. And of course, we are looking at the oil spill over the ocean, so we care about the ocean part of the image. So let's have a look now to the remote sensing background and understand how satellites can help in this type of applications. application. So ocean pollution, ocean pollution due to oil spills remains a major environmental hazard. Although oil tanker accidents are well known, they are not the main cause for this type of event. Illegal discharges from ships or offshore platforms, drilling rigs, pipeline accidents or natural leaks, amongst others, bring together most of the, source, most of the sources for oil pollution in the ocean. Methods for the detection and tracking of oil spills and illegal oil discharges are of fundamental importance for improving the efficiency of maritime surveillance systems. The key advantages of space-borne Earth observation, together with the characteristics of synthetic aperture radar sensors, that is day and night and all weather sensing capabilities, enables to form the basis of a viable and useful tool for the detection, mapping and monitoring of oil spills. The imagery data from the Sentinel satellites enables a new approach for oil spill mapping and monitoring. The combination of the temporal and spatial resolution together with relevant analysis can lead to improvements of the decision-making process. So for this exercise, we will be using C-band SAR data provided by the Sentinel-1A satellite. The Sentinel satellites are included in the space component of the Copernicus program of the European Commission and the European Space Agency. And in case, just a couple of details about the Sentinel-1 mission, it is formed by a constellation of two twin satellites phased at 180 degrees to each other. It is an active, an active sensor that works on the C band, providing data with a short repeat cycle and with different imaging modes. So let's move now to the root service. So first of all, Bruce 
stands for Research and User Support for Sentinel Core Products. It is an initiative founded by the European Commission and managed by ESA, with the objective to promote the uptake of Copernicus Sentinel data and support R&D activities. The service provides a free and open scalable platform in a powerful computing environment, hosting a suite of open source toolboxes pre-installed on virtual machines, which allow you to handle and process the data derived from the Sentinel satellites. So what does that mean in other words? Well, with a large amount of data produced by the Sentinel satellites, the challenge is no longer data availability, but rather storage and processing capacity. To solve that, Roos offers virtual machines so that you have the appropriate computing environment to handle the data. In addition to all that, Roos also provides a specialized user help desk to support your remote sensing activities with Sentinel data and a dedicated training program. So if you are working with Sentinel data or you think you will, you can subscribe to Roos, you can become a Roos user, you can get a virtual machine for free, plus the support for a team of experts that can help you in your processing and some training activities such as this webinar or even face-to-face -face events. So you can find all the information of the Roos service in our two Roos uh, websites. We have the roos-copernicus.eu and the Roos training. In the first one, you will find all the information about the project and uh, it is in this website where you will be able to subscribe. And in the second one, we have all the information about the training we do, such as the webinar you are, attending today or other events as face-to-face as -face trainings that we organize as well. So I really recommend you to visit those websites after the webinar if you have some time or later on. You can find uh, a lot of useful information there. In addition, we have uploaded three short videos in our YouTube channel where we summarize the main steps you need to perform to become a Roos user. So those are how to, how to register for Roos, how to request a virtual machine. So they are very short, couple of minutes. And there you can find all you need in order to apply for the virtual machines and start to use Roos for your projects. So without any further ado, let's start with our exercise today and let's see how we can use Sentinel-1 for all speed mapping. So for that, I'm going to open my Roos virtual machines and here we are in the main Roos website. So let's imagine I, I already uh, uh, register for Roos. I already apply for my virtual machine, so now I just have to log in on the website. And once I'm in, I can just go to my dashboard, and here I will have my here I have my virtual machine. So I just need to wait until it's loaded, and now I can access my virtual machine. Put my um, my credentials. So you will receive all this information via email once you subscribe for Roos. So here we are in the Roos virtual machine. As you can see, it's a regular Linux environment. Uh, and a couple of words about the VM. First of all, you have full administration rights. That means that you can install and modify the VM as you want. You can install software, either if it's open source or commercial software, but just remind that we do not provide commercial licenses for that, so you need to have your own one. But if you do, you can install all the software you want. Um, you can also very easily upload and download files from the virtual machine to your local computer. And for that, we just need to press the key combination control alt shift If we do so, we access this side menu, and here we can just navigate through the uh, folders of our virtual machine. And for example, if we want to download something, we just need to navigate to the path and for example, double click on the file we want to download. We can also upload a file by following the same procedure. We just need to click here in upload file, and then we can select the file in our local computer to be sent to the virtual machine. So for the exercise today, we will be using SNAP. So SNAP is the ESA software to process Sentinel data. And uh, as, as, you, as you may know, when, uh, when getting the Roos virtual machine, you get already a predefined list of software that is already installed and ready to use. So one of, of the software that is available is Snap, so we can just double click here and open it. So let's open the software and start to process our image. So in case this is the first time you are using Snap, let, let me give you a very brief introduction to this interface. So we have here the uh, product product explorer where all the files that we will be using will start to appear. You will see that later. Here in the lower left corner, we have um, some quick menus that we can use to 
manipulate our, our image. You will see later how we use this. And here we have the main area where the, where the image is um, displayed. And of course, here on top we have all the tools we need to process our image. Uh, for example, the raster tools, the tools for optical sensors, radar, etc. Et so let's start by opening the image. For that, we can click in the open um, product icon or just in file open product. And now we just need to navigate to the path where we have our image. In this case, this is the path. And now here we have our image in the product explorer. So as you can see, we have index one. So what to say about this product? Well, the first thing we can do is to expand the product and access some extra information. For example, we have the metadata folder where all the useful information about the image is stored. So for example, if we open abstract metadata, we can see um, a lot of information of this product, for example, the mission, uh, the antenna pointing, the acquisition mode, if it was ascending or descending, etc. So you can check that later. We also have um, the bands folder where actually we have the images that were captured by the sensor. So if we open here, we have amplitude and intensity. So just remember, intensity is the square of the amplitude, so this is a virtual band. That means that it is not physically saved on our, on our hard disk, it's calculated, from the, uh, it's calculated by the software directly. So let's open Amplitude VV, for example. So we just double click on, on, the, um, on the file, and then the image will, will be displayed. Okay, there we go. So this is what we see when opening um, a Sentinel-1 SAR image. So if you come from the optical community, you will see that it's very different, but still we can see some useful things. First of all, we see uh, those three, mm, let's call it rectangles or sub watts. So those are the consequence of the acquisition mode that is used by Sentinel-1. In this case, we are using interferometric white acquisition mode, and that means that the image is scanning through the, th through the track of, of the satellite, and it's acquiring three different images that are, that are later on merged. And we have here, and, and that's why we have those three, let's say, main areas. We can use the pan mode to navigate over the image, and we can also use the zoom tool uh, to zoom in. So if we go over here, we can already start to see a dark region in the ocean. Okay, we will talk about that later on. I just want to point out that, for example, we see urban areas in, um, in very bright, so white pixels, but also if we zoom into the ocean, we see that there is a lot of random behavior in the backscatter. So we have some dark pixels and then some um, very bright pixels. So the, the signal that's coming back from the ocean is actually, it's kind of random. It's not the same when, when we look over land or it's, I mean, not as random as over the ocean. So it's, it's obvious that we have to do some work to the image before we can create some useful results. So this very dark region that we can See here, it's actually the oil spill that took place uh, that day, the 10th of August 2017. And this is our study area. Uh, if we look at the image, uh, at the complete scene, we can see actually that there is a trend of um, from left to right. Uh, we, we could say that here it's more bright than that here on the, on the right side. And this is the consequence of the right side looking direction of the SAR sensor. So the, the, SAR, the satellite is orbiting over the Earth and it's looking to the right and it's sensing in that direction. And that's why in the near range we have brighter areas than in the far range of the image. So let's talk a little bit more about how the backscatter over the ocean um, is created. So the um, backscatter of the SAR sig signal over the ocean is mainly a result of sea roughness and it's determi determined by small surface waves that are usually called gravity capillary waves. Um, those are also linked to the uh, superficial ocean currents and wind speed, wind speed and direction. So oil films decrease the sea surface roughness and hence the backscatter. And this causes spills to appear darker in SAR images than spill-free areas. However, the contrast between polluted and non-polluted areas depends on different parameters, such as the wave height, the wind speed, the type of oil, or even the sensor characteristics, such as the wavelength or polarization. And I want to just stop a little bit in polarization. 
If we look at this image, this is the VV polarization, so vertical, vertical. We are transmitting the signal in the vertical position and we are only receiving in vertical. But if we open the VH, the amplitude VH, we will see that the same area, okay, it's loading the image, okay, we will see that the same area, we cannot actually see the oil spill. Uh, there is a very nice feature in SNAP, we can combine both views if we go to Windows, tile horizontally, and here we see the difference. In VH, well, we don't see at all the, uh, the oil spill, while in VV, it's very obvious. So, as you can see, even the sensor characteristics can determine your ability to detect an oil spill or not. So, let's start our processing. The first thing we are going to do is to subset the image. As you can see, the area, the image, the product covers a, a very big area, and we just want to focus on this specific region. So, for that, we subset the image. So, we select the product and we go to raster subset, and here we can create a subset in different ways. We can, for example, draw uh, our region in this thumbnail here. We can also define some pixel coordinates or apply a subset by using lat long coordinates. So in my case today, I'm using pixel coordinates. So let me just define uh, the area. I'm just going to input the parameters here. OK, so here we have our subset area. I just click OK. So now the, the output of this operation will appear here in the Product Explorer. As we can see, it has index 2, and we have this keyword uh, subset, which is linked to the operation that we have done. So when you create a subset, don't, uh, don't forget to save the product, um, because if not, it will not be saved. I will just save it here, and there it goes. So now we can um, keep moving. So the next step is going to be spec on filter. So as you can see, the image, oh, sorry, let me just show you the subset area. We can expand the product and go to bands and open again amplitude VV. Of course, nothing have, has changed. It's just the same image, but a smaller region. So the next step we want to do is to reduce this random behavior we have over the ocean. So as, as you see, if I zoom in a lot, you will see that we have a lot of, of random behavior of the signal, and we want to reduce this a little bit to improve the, the contrast between the area that is affected by the oil spill and the area that is free of pollution. And for that, we apply this speckle filter. So to, ap sorry, to apply the, the speckle filter, we select again the product, and we go to radar, speckle filtering, single product speckle filter. We are using one image today, so no need to do multi-temporal speckle filter. So here we have the common interface of SNAP, uh, of the tools of SNAP. We have a, a first tab, which is input-output parameters. Here, here we specify the input product and the output directory. And then we have the processing parameters tab, where we set the parameters of the tool. So in our case, we just need to make sure that we are saving the, um, the product in the appropriate folder. And for the processing parameters, we will leave everything as default. And now we can just press Run. So the process is, let's say, very fast. It takes almost 20 seconds. So I will just run it uh, live so you can see it. OK, so almost done. And now we will have a look to the output of this tool, and we will see the difference of, uh, of a of a SAR image that has this speckle filter applied and, and a SAR image that, that doesn't have this. So let's close here and let's... So we have now this product number three and if we go at the end we see that we have this um, suffix SPK which is linked to the speckle filter we have performed. So let's open the bands folder and again open the uh, band amplitude VV. And again let's link uh, both views so we can compare directly. So as you can see, the image looks a little bit darker. That's that's okay, no problem. But if we zoom in, we can see that this random behavior or um, this variation has been reduced. Still, you can see some patterns, but it's not as random um, as in the 
as in the image without the speckle filter. So that's good. We have already reduced a little bit this noise in the image. And if we go to the dark area where the oil spill is, is we can see that it's, let's say, that the darkness is much more homogeneous than in the image without the speckle filter. So this will actually help us a lot in order to create this extent from the image. So let's close the image number two. And now let's keep moving with our processing. So just to give you a, a theoretical note on what speckle filter is, speckle noise-like feature is a common phenomenon in SAR systems. It confers to SAR images a granular aspect and random spatial variation and may decrease the utility of SAR imagery. The source of this noise is attributed to random interference between the coherent returns and the principle of speckle filtering is to reduce the variance of the complex speckle scattering and improve the estimation of the unspeckled scattering coefficient. So this is actually what we have done. So next, what we are going to do is to convert the band to the decibel scale. So this will allow us to have a better contrast between the, the affected area and the rest of the image. And for that, it's very easy. We just need to go to the, to the uh, image, to the band that we want to convert. And we right click and select linear to from decibel. So we are changing the, the, the scale that is used to assign the colors uh, to the pixels of the image. It's just a logarithm, a logarithmic scale, the decibel scale. So it's well known. So we just press yes. And now we see that the, uh, this band has been added to the product. And it has this V here. Remember, this means that the bands doesn't exist. It has been created by the software, but if we close the product right now, it's not saved. So we want to save it, and for that we just right click and select convert band. So now the band has been saved and it doesn't have the, the V anymore. So let's open it. And let's compare both views again. Let's zoom a little bit. Okay, so, so as you can see on the left side we have the image, the, the regular image, and on the right side we have the uh, decibel SAR image. So as you can see it's a little bit, a little bit brighter and we can uh, see the contrast, contrast much better. Now we are almost ready to do our oil spill mapping and what we need to do first is to characterize a little bit more the, the, the backscatter that is coming back from the polluted area. So I'm going to close this view now and what we are going to do is to create a profile plot. We can use this tool here in Snap, which is a drawing line tool. So this tool creates or draws a line over the image. So let's draw a line, for example, over here, like this. So we are going all over through the polluted area, then we are in this area where there is no pollution, and so on. So now we want to see the evolution of the pixel values of the backscatter uh, all over this line. And so that's the profile plot. And to see this profile plot, we go to analysis, profile plot. Already we can see some trends, but let's improve this. First of all, let's zoom in a little bit. And we just select this area to zoom in, okay. And now we can um, select a bigger box size to smooth a little bit the trend that we are seeing. So let me just change this parameter. Okay, and let me just zoom in again. Okay, so, and I will do it bigger as well. Okay, so what we see here is the evolution of the pixel values in the decibel scale all over our image. And actually, if I click on the graph, I can see the value in this specific position, where if you look in my, in, if you look in the yellow line, you will see that while I move all over the graph, I can see exactly where in my line I am. I can very easily recognize the pixel values uh, to a specific location. So the line starts in an area that is not dark, so an area that is not affected by the oil spill. So we have a backscatter in the decibel scale of 19, let's say 19, 19.5, more or less. Uh, as soon as we reach a dark area, it goes down to 16. Then we have here some mixture of pixels that are polluted and non-polluted, but if we go a little bit more here in this clear dark, uh, sorry, in this dark area, we see that the value is very stable in the range of 16. Now when we reach this uh, non-dark area, again the values go up 
and when we reach again the polluted area it goes down and so on and so on. So this gives you already an idea of how the presence of an oil spill affects the backscatter. And this actually helps us a lot to delineate and map the extent of an oil spill. And this is actually what we are going to do in the next step. So just remember, we are going from a value of 19, let's say, let's say 19, to a value of 16 in the dark area. So if, there, if we do not have oil spill, we have 19. If we do have an oil spill, we have 16 in this specific case. So let's move on. Our next step will be then uh, the oil spill mapping. So to identify oil spills in the ocean, we will use this Sentinel-1 data and a dedicated tool that SNAP offers for this purpose. However, it has to be highlighted that only possible oil spills are detected since some specific conditions of the ocean can generate similar visual patterns to the ones of an oil spill. What do I mean by that? Well, here we have a dark area and this is clearly an oil spill because we know. But it can happen that due to the conditions of the ocean, due to specific wind spins, wind speed and directions, we, we can see dark areas over the image, for example here, that can be detected by the algorithm as an oil spill, but actually they are not. It's just uh, an addition of circumstances that are creating this dark area. So this is something that, that, is, that we cannot change. This is something that happens, and that's why when doing oil spill mapping with, with SAR, we always talk about possible detections. We cannot be 100% sure unless we have ground truth data or some type of validation data. Of course, the, uh, the extent, the form, uh, sorry, the, the shape of the, of the dark region, the extent, um, if we also track this with other data, for example, if it's coming from a ship, we can know the location. So specific um, characteristics of the, of the dark area can tell us already if it's really um, an oil spill or not. But actually, it can happen that that you are detecting something as an oil spill while it is not. So in this specific case, uh, validation data is very important, as in many other applications, applications, applications. Sorry, with remote sending data. So the oil spill detection tool that we are going to use includes two pre-processing steps: mask out the inland areas and radiometric calibration so that pixel values truly represent the radar backscatter of the reflecting surface. After those pre-processing steps, dark spots are detected using an adaptive threshold algorithm where the local mean backscatter level is estimated using pixels in a larger window. After that, a threshold is set to specific uh, amounts of decibels below the local mean calculated before. And pixels within the window with values lower than the threshold are detected as dark, dark spots. Finally, the detected pixels are clustered into a single cluster and those with sizes smaller than a predefined area that is selected by the user are eliminated. So let's do that. We go to radar, SAR applications, ocean applications, OS spill detection. So this is a tool that's already included in SNAP. Then we just need to set the parameters. So the first one is the input image we are going to use, so number three the one with the speckle filter. Then we will, we will apply a land sea mask. So we want to remove all those areas that are not in the ocean because it doesn't make sense to run this application over the land. So we can just remove that. So we leave all the parameters here as default to perform the, the land sea mask. Then in the calibration tab, we leave everything as default. Here we will convert the pixel values to, um, to um, to calibrate the pixel values where we can be sure and that the backscatter that is coming back to the sensor truly represents um, uh, or, true, or has a physical meaning. And then in those two consecutive tabs, we will perform the OSPIL mapping. So we can select the input bands and we will just use the Sigma VV. Remember at the beginning, the, the VH polarization doesn't help a lot in this case, so no need to use it. And then we need to set the background window size and the threshold shift. So 
For this specific application, we are using a background window size of 1400 um, in, in terms of window size. And then we need to apply a threshold shift. So here we are creating this uh, window and we, are say, and we are telling the software or the algorithm that we are expecting a shift in the values of 3.5. Why 3.5? Well, if you remember the plot I was showing before, we were seeing that the pixels, sorry, that the, the decibel values were uh, dropping from 19 to 16, more or less. So that's 3, 3.5, more or less. So that's why I'm selecting this parameter. Why 1400? Well, this is something that you have to try. When running this type of algorithm, there is no uh, predefined value that can be used. Of course, you can do some uh, quick tests, but actually the idea is to analyze the backscatter from the oil spill and then try different window sizes to see how well it's performing. And depending on the shape and extent of your oil spill, you might want to change those parameters. So those works for this specific case in Kuwait, but if you are repeating this exercise later on, you might want to change them or even to try several times. Then the next step will be the clustering. So here we will set um, the value to the default one, so no need to change anything. And finally, in the right tab, we just need to specify the name of the output product and the uh, folder where we are saving our output. So for the name, I'm just going to add SPK for speckle, and I'm also adding the parameters I've used. So 1403.5. That way, if you repeat the same analysis with different parameters, you can keep track of, of um, your methodology and your results. So after that, we can press the Run button and have a look at the result. So I'm not going to run the process because it takes a little bit, so I will show you directly the result. So here we have the output, and now if we expand it, we can go to the Bands folder and open Sigma uh, VV. I will close this one. We can also actually open the, well, okay, so we see here uh, Sigma VV. This is the output of the oil spill uh, detection, but we are not uh, still checking the mask. So we can also open the, the Sigma VV in decibels, so to improve a little bit the visualization, okay. So here we can see that actually um, the, the contrast is much better. So now let's have a look to the mask that the algorithm has created. This mask is here and it's named Sigma 0 VV oil spill bit mask. So if we open it, we can see the mask now appearing here. There it goes. By, de uh, by default, the, the mask would be white, but you could change the color. I've done that before. If you go to the color manipulation tab table, you can change, for example, to uh, to green if you want. I mean, it's up to you. So in this case, we are using red. But now, in order to really visualize how well the uh, tool has performed, let's combine both layers in the same view. So for that, um, we go to Layer Manager. We, uh, sorry, we go here, we go to Layer Manager. Uh, we select plus and image of band and now we select the Sigma 0 VV oil spill mask. So this is the band we want to overlay with the actual view we have. So we click finish and there we go. So here we have the image and the oil spill mask that has been created by the algorithm. As we can see it works pretty well. I mean um, if we zoom in a little bit we see that for example in the edges I mean, it's very, um, it's, it's um, delineating the dark area very well. Of course, in some areas, not working very well, for example, here. And this is something that, that depends on your window size mainly, I would say, not that much in your, um, in your decibel threshold that you are specifying. If you change the threshold, it might be that, you're, that you will include some of those pixels, but I would say the, the the window size that you are moving to analyze the image is more important. So for example here, it works pretty well because all this area is dark and here we have a clear spot and it's not detected. Or for example here. <clears throat> but of course in some other areas, 
for example, here there's are there's a um, I mean there's areas that are not detected. For example, also here, uh, so it's it doesn't work completely, but it gives us a good delineation of of the area that is affected. And for the purpose of oil spill mapping or of um, monitoring the progress of an oil spill, it's it's good enough. Something that I want to highlight is, is um, those false uh, positives. So here we have, for example, some detection of the oil spill, uh, also here. And those are actually lookalikes that are classified as oil spill. Why do I know that this is a lookalike? Well, just because seeing the extent of this um, main area, it doesn't make sense to have for this specific um, oil spill, it doesn't make sense to have an oil spill here since there is no connection be between this area and this area. So this is the consequence of those lookalikes phenomena that can happen in SAR images and that can be identified as, um, as oil spills actually. So we are almost done with uh, the methodology. The only thing now that we need to do is to project the image properly because right now, we are still working on the SAR geometry, but we have to, let's say, turn the image properly so that it's projected. So what we, what we are going to do is, is then to reproject our image in a specific coordinate reference system. And to perform this step, we will use the ellipsoid correction. So in SNAP, you have different options to perform geometric corrections for SAR imagery, but in this case, we are using the ellipsoid correction and not the terrain correction or range Doppler terrain correction. Since our study area is in the ocean, we do not need to correct for geometric distortions of the SAR backscatter because those distortions do not happen in the ocean. So let's, um, let's do that and, and let's click on radar, geometric, terrain correction, sorry, ellipsoid correction, geolocation grid. So what we are going to do here is to use the geolocation of the image to project it in our projection setting. So we have again the same input-output uh, layout. So <clears throat> just make sure you are using the appropriate input and that you are saving the uh, output image in the appropriate path. Again, this is the name we will give it and we will add the EC um, suffix to the product so that we can know that we have performed this type of operation. In the processing parameter tab, you just need to change the map projection. So we want to project the image in a UTM zone and there is a very convenient way to do that in SNAP. We can just click here and in this drop down menu we can go down and select UTM automatic. So the software will locate the image and will apply the parameters that belongs to this specific UTM zone. So in this case it's the zone 39. So that's great. Now we can just press run and and have a look to the result. So again, I'm not running this analysis to save some time, so I will show you directly the result. So let me open the product. There it goes. And here we have. So I will close this view here. And now let's open the output, the uh, sigma VV in decibels as before. And now we will add on top of that, the mask that is also projected. There we go. Finish. Okay. Okay. Let me just redo it again. Maybe I was too fast. Oh no, there it goes. Okay. So, if you are aware of uh, the position of Kuwait in the world, you can see now that the image makes sense. We we have the ocean to the right and the land to the left. Before it was the other way around because the image was acquired by the Sentinel One satellite while it was in a descending orbit and it was looking to the right. So that why, that's why the image was turned over. So now we have this output and we can then export, for example, the output from SNAP. Let's imagine we want to put this in a GIS system where we want to perform some post-processing analysis such as some buffer around the uh, detected area or, for example, we want to overlay this with, um, with some base map, etc. So it's very easy to do, to do that. We can, for example, open the oil spill mask and if we want to export it, we can just right click and say export view as image. So here we can select, well, we can first of all navigate to the path where we want to save the image, select the format, for example, GeoTIFF, and then we can just 
give it a, a name, for example, mask. And just press save. So the, um, okay, well, in this case, let's just, okay, so it seems that it was saving it as a TIFF, but I've done already uh, the process as a GeoTIFF. You can also export the image by going to File, Export, GeoTIFF. It's the same as right-clicking on the image. So let's have a look to this output product in another software. For that, I'm closing Snap, I'm minimizing Snap, and let's open QGIS. So it's very convenient because in that way you can do all the analysis in Snap, and you can, for example, export the final product as GeoTIFF, and you can then send that to your computer or still keep working on your virtual machine. So let's open the TIFF file, the GeoTIFF file, sorry, and here it comes. So we are already in GIS, so we can uh, run um, any of the post-processing analysis that you might think are relevant in this case. Uh, for this webinar, I'm just putting this information with a base map. So for example, we can go to web. If you have the Open Layers plugin, we can overlay this with some um, Google Street uh, base map. And for example, we can see here the extent of the oil spill, still the lookalikes that were detected, the road network, etc. So you can think about many, many applications and many ways of combining this information with, um, with external data that can improve even more the ability to use the output from Sentinel imagery to this type of uh, application and the decision-making process that, that is required to manage this type of situation. So before finishing this webinar, I just want to highlight a couple of um, take-home messages that I think are relevant. So let me just go back to my presentation. So the, the, the key message that you have to remember is that with the new Sentinel satellites, the challenge in satellite remote sensing is no longer data availability, but rather how to store and process all the information. In addition to that, it is necessary to explain how the data can be used and support users in their application. The root service is here to solve those problems by providing virtual machines to store and process the data, and by offering a dedicated help desk supported by a team of remote sensing experts to help you in your projects with Sentinel data. So before moving to the um, Q&A session, let me tell you again how you can repeat this exercise by your own. So uh, for that, you have to go to the Rules Copernicus website and register as a Rules user. And while you apply for the Rules virtual machine, and remember we have uh, three short videos in our YouTube channel where we explain all those steps. You can just um, write here this code, which is OSHA03. If you do so, we will know that you want to repeat this webinar and we will provide you with all the training kit that you need, that is all the, imp the input images and all the auxiliary data and a step-by-step -step guide to perform the same analysis I've shown today. So that's all from my side. Um, I hope you have uh, learned something new today. So again, thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar. I hope you have learned something new today. I hope you you've, uh, find it, you found it interesting. Um, so thank you also to the rest of the team that has been involved in the, in the webinar, and I'll see you in the next one. Ciao.